anti-Semitism. Is there a point of no return with regards to anti-Semitism in British society? And have we reached it? Are we near it? And can we avoid it? I think the answer to this question which by now everybody is aware of, the dangers of rising racism generally in uh, society. Uh, the answer to this question relies upon, I think, certain premises that I would like to elaborate. Uh, we've all seen, and many of us, I should say, have seen the images coming from the football stadiums uh, with certain fans, one of whom has now since been arrested, uh, basically chanting uh, racist abuse at football players um, who happen to be black, uh, making monkey gestures, throwing things at their heads, Generally, hate crime and racism is on the rise and all racism is evil. All racism is evil because it scapegoats and dehumanizes a group in society for the purposes of coming to the power off their backs, off the back of scapegoating certain groups in society. And though all racism is evil, there are, to give you an analogy from Lord of the Rings... Rings of power that bring evil people to authority. But there is one ring that unites them all. And the one ring of racism, even though I say all racism is evil, just practically the one ring for racism is anti-Semitism. And I'm going to explain to you why I believe this is. Racism against blacks and browns, people of colour, ethnic minorities, whichever word you wish to describe, coming from the right is usually directed from the right to people that look like me. But usually, usually the left, the far left even, even the masked Antifa far left, doesn't attack people that look like me. On the other hand, if you look to other forms of racism, prejudice and bigotry, perhaps homophobia even, again, there are certain groups of society that discriminate against gay people and certain groups that don't. But there's one form of prejudice, which historically and today we witness it, is managing to unite disparate groups like the one ring that united evil people in Tolkien's uh, uh, saga around the evil lord of Sauron. And that one form of bigotry is anti-Semitism. It is no surprise to me that hating Jews is something that those on the far left advocate those on the far right advocate and the Islamist theocrats themselves also advocate. It's the one form of racism that can bring the triple threat to liberal democratic values together. That triple threat being, as I said, the far left, the far right, and in modern times, the Islamist extremists as well, which European history uh, would have been replaced with uh, Catholic extremists. So let's call them religious extremists. But in today's polity, that means Islamist religious extremists. It's the one ring. It's the one form of bigotry that brings them all together. And when it does so, when it does so, the descriptions left and right cease to be relevant. What do I mean by that? Typically in this country, up until at least uh, for the last five years, we have assumed when we talk about racism that we're talking about people that shave their heads this is a stereotype. Of course, not every skinhead is a racist. In fact, the, reggae, the, the, the scar movement in music began with skinheads. Uh, but, you know, th what I'm talking about now is the assumptions we've typically made. People who shave their heads wear green bomber jackets and Dot Martin boots. And those assumptions have some basis in reality because that's the kind of people that used to chase me around Essex when I was young. Again, with a caveat that not all skinheads are racists. But that's what we've typically assumed. But actually, if you look to how anti-Semitism works in today's discourse, is it any surprise to you that the former leader of the BNP, Nick Griffin, has voiced his support for people on the far left, including Jeremy Corbyn, who have taken certain views around these sorts of topics? In, 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 in current times, what I'm arguing is that anti-Semitism is the only form of racism that, can com that has the potential to completely take over our society because it unites all the extremes. And in doing so, it paves the way for the takeover of our institutions. Now let's go back to, Wei to, to the Weimar Republic and the, and the period of Weimar Germany before Hitler came to power, and you will see those lessons 
there as plain as day for us to learn. Now, we study this in school, folks. We every year say never again for a certain reason. And despite the fact we say never again, it did happen again in Bosnia. So first point, we're not immune from repeating the mistakes of Nazi Germany in Europe. We've already repeated them in Bosnia. We've already come close to repeating them elsewhere. We are not immune. So let's stop believing that somehow... In our self-righteous arrogance, we've learned those lessons and we now can stop talking about them. One of the biggest mere culpas I issue of late is my naive belief after President Obama was elected that we entered into a post-racial era. How wrong was I? But at the time when I recognised I was wrong, I didn't realise just how wrong I was. Because I was wrong thinking that racism against people like me has come back. I had thought it had gone away. But the extent of my analysis was it's come back in society. But actually, the problem is a lot, lot worse than that. Racism hasn't just come back in society. Racism is taking over our institutions. And that's what we mean by institutional racism. It's taking over organs that, op that we need to operate as a society, such as political parties, such as uh, you know, uh, 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 movements and, and discourse and so on and so forth. When you see anti-Semitism being investigated in, I think it's three conservative politicians and political uh, 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 public figures as well now, as well as the concerns about it in Labour, when you see people throwing and making monkey gestures and throwing things at football players in this country, you realise just the stage at which we're in. Now, I in my naivety, thought that once Obama became president, we'd move beyond that. And how wrong was I? But now I'm saying, what's the second mistake I made? The second mistake I made was not recognising early enough. And I'm among those that most people would say recognised it early on. And I say about myself, I don't think I recognised it early enough. Just how dangerous this, anti, this pernicious anti-Semitism is for our country and for our social fabric. It is the one form of bigotry, as I say again, that has the potential to unite Nick Griffin on that side with far left activists on the other side, as it has done already. This is not me making it up, folks. Look it up. Google it. Look who Nick Griffin has endorsed. There's an article in the New Statesman there for you telling he is singing Corbyn's praises. How is the far right endorsing the far left? We're through the looking glass. That's what anti-Semitism does. And there's no doubt Nick Griffin is an anti-Semite. And the BNP is a racist party. And so we have this situation now where we are through the looking glass. But as I said, there are lessons we could have learned from the Weimar Republic. What were those lessons? And I think last caller before we began this topic was a was the best example, probably, of what I'm trying to say without making any allegations against the caller herself but rather the lessons that I'm trying to draw from. And it is important to learn those lessons. It's why we say never again. What did the National Socialist Party promise in Germany? Well, the first thing to remember is that Hitler was inspired by Mussolini. It began in Italy, where even today certain populists are popular in elections. What began in Italy was a member of the Italian directorate of the Italian Socialist Party, a man named by Mussolini, realised that there was an opportunity to carve out a, and I put this in quotes deliberately, a socialist narrative, because it's not a socialist narrative, but to carve out a socialist narrative by marrying it with xenophobia. In other words, and this is now an accurate way of describing it, adopting a left-wing position on economics with a right-wing position on social issues. Now, what Mussolini did was he became xenophobic on immigration and foreigners and so on and so forth while promising state, industry, investment, infrastructure and nationalisation. That's how fascism was born. Fascism isn't a product of the left. Fascism is not a product of the right. We often misdiagnose the problem and therefore double down in denying that we have a problem because we think that we're immune from it. People say, right-wingers say, no, 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 we're not the ones who formed the Nazi party and the fascists, that was the left-wingers. And the left-wingers say, no, 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 it wasn't us, Gov, it was the right-wingers. The truth is, it was both of you. Left and right becomes irrelevant when fascism emerges because it is 
by definition, a product of the merger of both. And that's why I'm saying that the one thing that allows them to merge in that way is anti-Semitism. So look to what happened in Italy. Mussolini adopted left-wing economic policies with right-wing xenophobia. Then look to what happened. And, and by the way, I remind you, he was a member of the National Directorate of the Italian Socialist Party. He adopted left-wing economics with right-wing xenophobia. The original socialists then tried to challenge him for because they didn't like the right-wing xenophobia part of it. Just like the right-wingers didn't like the left-wing economics part of it. So let's not blame each other and recognise that fascism is, it occurs when the political horseshoe occurs, when both merge. It's not a right-wing, left-wing debate anymore. So then move to Germany. Hitler was inspired by Mussolini. That's known. That's just, that's just on the record. He was inspired by that merger of left-wing economics with right-wing fascism, uh, uh, xenophobia, that created fascism. And again, he decided to do the same thing. It's why he called them the National Socialists. The National Part is to represent the right-wing xenophobia and the socialist part, the left-wing economic policies. German workers first, where we heard that before. And so it, Hitler was also a product of this merger. And again, he then concentrated on, on the scapegoat, which is, you know, the foreigner, the other. And for Hitler, it was the Jews was the perfect target for his evil designs. And so now bring it to Britain. Oswald Mosley was the same thing. He was... A man who went through the Conservative Party, ended up in the Labour government as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in a Labour cabinet and then defected from Labour to form the Black Shirts of Britain. Mosley was, as an individual, a product of a man who took a journey from the Conservatives to Labour and then married both to set up the Fascist Party in Britain and again was left-wing economically, right-wing on his social issues. And so if we if we if we take if we take that if we take that phenomenon and apply it to modern times what I'm warning against is that happening here today in Britain if you hear people saying they want british workers to come first they don't like foreigners coming to this country meanwhile they are criticizing jewish money jewish banking jewish finance all of the anti-semitic tropes you heard that hitler used before if certain murals are going up depicting bankers that look like the tropes that hitler depicted them as if you're hearing people rail against the establishment then that's code for something else Please understand that people often use code when they speak in language. And when people are railing against the establishment, whether they're from the left or the right, it's usually code to mean that they are becoming authoritarian. They are railing against the existing authority because they want to replace it with their own authority, which is why I think the true struggle today on a societal level is one of liberalism with a small l versus authoritarianism with a small a. It is the struggle of totalitarian uh, uh, individuals and, and, and phenomena who want to dictate from the top what we should look like by playing on the least, on the lowest common denominator, which is our prejudices, our fears and our anger and our bigotry to try and gain as many votes as possible so they can take over from the top. And that phenomenon can occur whether it comes from the left or the right. It can outflank you from either of your wings because its destination isn't the left or the right. Its destination is the top. And the only way to defeat that is by staying on the bottom and pulling them down and never allowing them to come to power. And so it is my view that anti-Semitism is the one ring that unites all these extremes and that actually this is an effort for authoritarianism. Do you think that that is correct? Are you worried that anti-Semitism is so deeply ingrained in our society that there's a danger we're reaching that point of no return? I don't think we've reached it yet. Is there a way back from this? And once anti-Semitism is unleashed in society, is it ever possible to put it back in its box?